And again, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Jose Ignacio Gaña. He's a uh, he's assistant professor at the <laughs> faculty. Now I got it right. <laughs> at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Chile, where he has been most of his career. He obtained his um, a physician degree at the Faculty of Medicine. He also obtained his PhD in Biomedical Sciences. Actually, we were both together in the same lab for like eight years, <laughs> trying to get graduated. And uh, now he's been uh, doing a lot of work into monitoring um, anesthesia monitorization. He also does like a lot of like a basic scientific research on through brain uh, mechanisms. And today he's going to talk about uh, intraoperative pain uh, monitoring. Thank you, Francisco, for that kind introduction. I have to warn you, this is not, sadly for me is not going to show part of my work. It's still very in, in very early stages. And the idea of this technological symposium is that you as a community, even more than a scientist, know how things in, in science translate to things, in this case, in medicine. So uh, I'm going to review very quickly uh, some of the monitors there are today to, mo to assess pain during general anesthesia. So what I will like to do is to show you new and not so new devices uh, who are uh, engineered for the detection and quantification of pain or nociception. We, we will discuss that. Explain in a very simple way how they work. And if we have time, discuss uh, the importance of monitor pain or nociception. So what I will do is, oh, I missed talk about some definitions and some indefinitions, and, and then a review of the monitors and, and which principles uh, make them work. So let's start with definition. General anesthesia, for, for it's a state who is composed of certain features or remarkable features. The, Two most known are amnesia and unconsciousness. That's what Patrick and Emery and, and other people are trying to assess, uh, recording among other, things, among other things EEG. Do you hear me, Will? Or do I have to? Okay. But also includes immobility. Most of the patients under general anesthesia goes uh, pharma pharmacological paralysis. A stability of other system. There's no. There's no. Uh, it's not. Uh, if you have this, 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 but the patient is with low pressure or low oxygen, that's not a good general anesthesia. So, I agree with people who include this uh, fifth uh, part of general anesthesia, which is stability of other systems and analgesia. Okay. That's the part we're going to uh, talk today. What is analgesia? Uh, this is lights are very easy, for, very easy for me because I go to Yasp web page and cut and paste their definitions. So, because there might be many, but most of us agree that those are the most used. Analgesia is the absence of pain in response to simulation that normally produce pain. What is pain then? Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional. It has two, at least for EASP, it has two dimensions. One is sensory dimension and one is emotional dimension. There are some other people which I may be in which are another dimension that's cognitive dimension of pain. It's a unpleasant sensory emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. It's a tricky definition, but we all kind of an intuitive have uh, unpleasant sensory emotional with actual tissue damage. Okay, I, I don't know, get burned. I, or I nail myself with the hammer, okay? Potential tissue damage, it's, for example, when, you, when you're getting close to heat, but you're not burning yourself, your, your tissue does not burn, 
but you get pain. And describe in terms of such damage, maybe a good example, for example, migraine. You don't have tissue damage or potential tissue damage, but you have a sensation that is described in terms of tissue damage. Oh, my headaches, like they were crushing it or they were hammering or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and I, this, if you go to the WIA's uh, webpage, this the, uh, definition has a long note. But I just copy and paste the first one that says the inability to communicate verbally does not negate the possibility that the individual is experiencing pain and in need for appropriate pain relieving. Okay? Because that's what maybe is happening while the patient is under gene anesthesia. He's suffering pain, but he or she is not able to tell us. <laughs> what is consciousness? Oof. I would leave that to Lucia. But uh, I took the quick way, so I go to the dictionary and copy and paste the definition, okay? Since this is a, a Spain dictionary, I put it in Spain, and here's in English, okay? It's a property of the human spirit to recognize itself in its essential attributes and in all the modification that it's, it goes, undergoes in itself. Complicated, okay? Pretty complicated. Even in Spanish, it's complicated for those who are native in Spanish. So, what is nociception? Pretty easy, copy paste until here. Uh, the neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. And it has an, uh, this definition also has a note which might be important for this talk. This says the consequence of encoding may be autonomic or behavioral. Behavior during general anesthesia is kind of hard to measure, but autonomic is more simple to measure. And we were gonna see that some monitors use this kind of tricky part in the definition. So maybe this talk is not about pain, it may be about intraoperative nociception monitoring. We may discuss this in the end. Okay, why we need to monitor pain introvertively? I would say the most important one is the first one, is ethic to the person, especially if that person is a patient and has a specialist in pain just a few meters away to treat their pain. And in a more physiological or part of physiological point of view because the mechanisms that account for acute post-operative pain or even chronic post-operative pain that are, believe me, problems after surgery. We anesthesiologists try to not to look too much at it, but if you look at the numbers, they are not so good. How many people suffer from acute, moderate or severe pain after surgery, it depends on the on the studies, but can go up to 75% of the people. Despite they have supposedly specialists and, and, and people worrying about it. And as Patrick showed, because responsible for pharma pharmacological therapy is individual. Now, as the same dose can have huge uh, different effects in one person uh, from other. Okay. That's uh, the definition or the indefinitions. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the, the technology we have today. But uh, I have to be honest, this technology is in a more uh, experimental phase than what Patrick or Pierre Equipe will show us. I've never used any one of these monitors. I don't know, uh, I, in Chile I know a few who have used one. Uh, this, they are still not uh, a regular monitor in the OR. Why? My opinion is because we are we're still very far away from a real objective pain assessing. So these are, I would say, the first tries. But somebody has to be first, okay? Or some, at some point we have to start. Okay, that's for those who work in the OR, that's maybe the problem, okay? 
what what kind of monitors I will show you? Those derived from encephalic activity or EEG activity? Those derived from autonomic nervous system activity? Or those derived from reflex pathways? Those are the great three families of monitors we have today. The EEG derived ones are three composite variable in the CVI, which is a derivative of BIS. BIS is a uh, depth, uh, depth of anesthesia monitor. It's more or less what Patrick has been working on. But this is an older one. It has, you can ask, it depends who you ask, but it has even several problems assessing uh, depth of anesthesia. Spectral entropy, which uses, which also, bo both of these are spin off of monitors were designed to assess unconsciousness and amnesia, not nociception. But they modify or make some tricky things to try to monitor uh, uh, nociception. And uh, there's a new one, the QNOX, which I have read of it, never even see one. The CVI, Composite Variability Index, is use EEG, derived from breeds, and EM EMG, activity, uh, and it used the variance of both measures. Uh, this is technically, it, it calculates variation for three minutes period and gives you a pain index or some on a susception index that go from zero to 10. Uh, there has been not so many clinical studies on it, but as a summary, this is going to go fast. Now, and it has higher probability of detecting movement since we don't, we cannot ask a patient whether is having nociception under gene anesthesia. One way to see is if it, the patient moves. We we can, with some confidence, say that okay, if it's moving, it's under nociception. We can discuss that. But that's how most of these works are done. One, uh, it has higher probability of movement of that. Uh, of movement detection than hemodynamics uh, variable that are the standard today. How uh, in the OR know if a patient is under pain or nociception because the heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, and but it's in the OR there are many things that can cause high blood pressure or high uh, heart rate. As I'm going to show you it's not predict of movement, only detects them. So it's, you cannot assess a state of good analgesia. You can only detect states of bad analgesia, okay? Uh, in non-stimulus situation, this is very technical, it correlates more strongly with hypnotics like propofol, sevoflurane, and, and so on, that with opioids that are our main tool for dealing with pain in the OR, okay? How anesthesiologists deal uh, Cause analgesia under general anesthesia, 99% of the time is by using opioids, which are uh, fam drugs, family, drugs family that are related to morphine, okay? Uh, and this is not, uh, this is a problem with all, most of the EEG derivative uh, monitors is altered while using neuromuscular blockers. As I told you, most of the patients under the anesthesia are paralyzed, pharmacologically paralyzed. And since this guy is, mesh, is based mostly on EMG activity, when you paralyze a subject, which is 90% of the time, its performance is not good. So as you can imagine, it's arguably a good uh, Nociception monitor. The other comes from another uh, depth of anesthesia monitor who use entropy. Uh, uh, entropy, as you may know, is how uh, disorder or run disorder is a signal. So when you, as Patrick can show you, when you induce anesthesia, entropy tends to go down. So it also it, it also was. Originally designed to uh, test or measure depth of anesthesia, but it has two variables: state entropy and response entropy. 
As you can see here, response entropy has a higher or larger uh, uh, wide band, has a wide band. It goes from 0 to 47 hertz. This goes up to 32. Be, I would say be, uh, beyond 32, EMG activity starts to show up. So you can probably say, OK, response entropy is entropy but plus EMG activity. So in a, in a way, it's also measuring muscular activity. So in a way, it's also affected by neuromuscular blockers. These two components have been told that uh, have been related to hypnotic component, and the response entropy has been, or the delta between response and state entropy has been related with nociception. That's the, the principle that uh, rules it. Well, there have been um, uh, few studies, not so much, that uh, show that in this response entropy or the difference between response and state entropy, uh, difference in patients who move and those who do not move, or uh, as we can, as I can tell you, patients who might be under nociception, or for those who might not be under nociception. And we, when you have this uh, delta very low, uh, or you keep it low. You, if you guide your analgesia to this index, you have lower consum opioid consumption and lower movement events. As, to be honest, these are very small trials, so I don't know um, how extrapolable is that. As I told you, this monitor does not predict, only detects, and also it's an altered by neuromuscular blockers. Ah, this is a funny thing. These studies show that uh, when you guide this, your analgesia to standard practice, or so you don't monitor, or you monitor using uh, this monitor, the pain measured by other people, not the patient, is similar. Now, and vomit are similar, but uh, pain for the patient when you use entropy it tends to be even a little larger. It is a sports operative pay, uh, pain. It's the same. I don't know. It's weird. They are in more pain, but they don't care. This is a new monitor. Uh, I just PubMed it, and I came up like three papers. There's not so much of it. Most of them, if not all, uh, write, written by the developers. So. There's not been an independent uh, assessment of, of its use. But it uses an adapt adaptive neurofuzzy interfere systems. Don't know what is that, but maybe some engineer can help us. It it's also give you an index between 0 and 99. 0 is perfect, no pain. 99 is per patient crying out. And, and uh, as the other monitors, it was also test against movement, uh, and it was able to predict whether the patient or not would move. This, have a, this in difference to the other one, has some prediction capabilities. The others do not predict, only uh, detect. Okay, this have, because as an anesthesiologist, since you are not an anesthesiologist, you don't want only to know that your patient is under pain. You want to know that your level of analgesia is good enough, that it won't suffer pain in the future, that we are safe that the surgeon can shuck, open him up, and he won't be feeling pain. So we would like to predict more than detect pain, okay? Okay, a summary, this is, this is gonna be a fast talk, I guess. The addition to EMG to EG monitors would increase uh, sensitivity versus standard practice as today is just looking at the patient or the monitors we have. Uh, it's especially useful in patients with attenuated autonomic response. Uh, they are not predictive, only reactive. Maybe QNOX has, is an exception. And it's limited in patients under N uh, neuromuscular block effect. And as I told you, are the large population on the gene anesthesia. So, uh, that can be not so good for this kind of monitors. Oras Wells uh, was 
Actually, the first guy who tried anesthesia with uh, nit nitrous oxide, but he fails, uh, and he fails in public, so he kind of never, the legend says that he can never uh, uh, move on with that. Actually, I read that after a time, he kind of started becoming addict to chloroform and ether. <laughs> Uh, and among his craziness due, due to ether or chloroform, uh, he threw acid to a prostitute and he was in jail. And in jail, drugs wash out and he realized what he has done and suicide himself. The legend says that part of it is was because his first attempt to anesthesia failed and he never recovered of that failure. And by no way he was a doctor. He was a dentist. As Morton. Morton was the guy who succeeded and who has a, the plague in, in where Patrick works, was also a dentist. Yeah, we, we're going to assess three monitors who use autonomic nervous system activity. Uh, the SBI, who use platysmographics. Plat 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 I don't know how to say it in Spanish. It's hard in English, so forgive me, skin conductance and heart rate variability. Okay, the SPI, who you might read of it as a surgical stress index, give you an index, use the amplitude. Uh, for those who don't know, all, pa all patients who go on the genial anesthesia will use a monitor that usually goes in the finger and uh, it's a platysmography that shows your pulse wave. And also, uh, it's designed to see how much oxygen is in your blood. So all patients under general anesthesia should go with this. It's a standard practice even in, even in Chile <laughs> now, in worldwide. Uh, so you, you are not using any new information, okay? Or any new, uh, you don't need a, a special Compl more complex device. You need the data, okay. But it uses the pulse amplitude and the interval between heartbeats. Uh, as I told you, both obtained through platysmography. Uh, one problem is that this requires learning. So each patient has to, before it go to surgery or anesthesia, need to stay with the monitor for a while and give you this index, who also goes from zero to 100. Don't ask me, and but to deal with that, why all manufacturers would like the index. We are, yeah, I would say we like to make things easy, but not, we're not stupid, I would guess, I don't know. Maybe too much index for everything, for, for us, for me at least, it's like we cannot do nothing more than read one number. I think we can do a little, a little more at least, okay. Uh, clinically, it has been a pilot study with 80 patients uh, and show us that uh, treating, treating your anesthesia to this index will result in lower drug use and lower hemodynamic stability and minor movement during surgery. It looks like clinically it works. Another um, study showed that 24 patients is a small uh, numbers, even for anesthesia. Uh, if somebody says, okay, there's a study which used 24 patients, as a doctor, you said, mm, mm. Or, or the effect is fantastic, or this is exploratory data. Okay, one, I will skip. One thing important with this is that changes with concentrations of remifentanil, which is an opioid. So you expect that something, if you have more opioids, your analgesia monitor is reflecting that. Let's move on. It may be, as a summary, believe me, it may be a good monitor to balance. It's related to opioids con effect site concentration. That's a uh, te technical term. It's not invasive and it's easy to install, but as all monitors who deal with autonomic nervous system, it is susceptible to everything that may change autonomic nervous system, which in the OR is a lot, okay? 
you can have uh, tachycardia or high or, or low blood pressure for many things other than nociception. You're bleeding, uh, you use a drug that, that affects cardiovascular system, etc. Cetera, et cetera. You are using drugs that block autonomous nervous system. Many patients today, are, our patients are getting older, and our population that use beta blockers, for instance, is growing up. Beta blockers blocks autonomic, autonomic nervous system. Another monitor is the skin's conductance. It's called MedStorm Stress Detector. Uh, as you may know, uh, stress increases sympathetic tone and it makes the skin sweat. And if you sweat, your uh, impedance, which is resistant in alternate current, correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, goes down. So you can in infer that the patient is in stress or pain or nociception by assessing her, his or her conductance. So as you can see, use palms or feet electrodes. It calculate peaks per seconds and area under the curve. He's a, this is an example from the manufacturer when uh, this is a stressful event or a painful event and you have no analgesia, this goes up. This is a little of opioids or drug. It tends to dis, uh, diminish the response and you have good analgesia, whatever it's that, you have no response. It's very experimental, I've never seen it. Uh, the good thing about it is maybe it has algorithm for neonates and intensive care units, which is important for us, believe me. Um, this is all technical, I will, I will skip it because we don't have so many time, but the, what can we say about stress detector? Many studies focus on hypnosis and anesthetic emergency with this stress detector more than nociception. Uh, little information regarding the detection of noxious stimuli in relation to the level anesthesia. There's very few, actually. Uh, and we don't have, from this monitor, at least when I review it, we didn't have any independent information. All the papers were published by the manufacturer. So, okay, we can believe them, but as a doctor, we, we would like somebody else to test your device. Uh, and we don't know when it fails. There's no perfect monitor. We would like to know when, uh, when it works and when we have to take uh, care of it inter its interpretation. This is, an, this is one of the most famous one, at least in terms of patient studies. It's the analgesia nociception index, which uses heart rate variability. And it uses in the, as the student learn during Monday, Tuesday, in the temporal domain and in the frequency domain. So probably it makes a, a spectral decomposition, I don't know, using fast Fourier transform, multi-taper or wavelet, I don't know, but it makes a spectral decomposition and takes an index for the low frequency and the high frequency. And it used the variability of this, uh, of the heart rate uh, during respiratory cycle. Uh, noxious stimuli determine variation in the high frequency. Essentially, uh, what it makes is tend to avoid high frequency in, in, in heart rate. It used, uh, in, in contrast to all others I've shown you, it shows you uh, an index that goes to zero to 100 when zero is the worst, okay? Zero is minimum parasymp parasympathetic index, so maximum stress. Uh, 15 patients, 25 patients. Um, this does also related to uh, remifentanil or opioid con uh, concentrations. <laughs> but in awake patients, where they can tell you that if they are in pain or not, it has a negative correlation. So, the patient told you that he's not in pain and the monitor told you that he is in pain. So that kind of uh, doesn't, doesn't make it look a very good uh, monitor. The problem is, I'm not trying to destroy these monitors. I think they are the first effort to assess something we are starting to get um, 
starting to know the the influence or the importance of monitoring nociception. Uh, we are still mainly focused on of death of anesthesia, of unconsciousness and and amnesia. Uh, there are a few efforts on trying to to assess this other component of gene anesthesia. So all these things, as I told you, are very initial efforts. So probably as everything in life, initial efforts are more tend to failure than when you are more uh, I don't know when you when you know more. As a summary, there are monitors who have shown even a small number of publications to be sensitive to nociceptive stimuli using autonomic nervous system. They seem to be better associated with noxious stimuli than EEG derivatives. They are not in none of them, none of the ones I show you are invasive, so easy to implement. They are not predictive too, but they are altering situations with as, as uh, autonomic nervous system is uh, affect like as I told you, many, many uh, way by many ways in in, in the war. This guy is William Morton. This guy is credited by the first successful anesthesia in the world, 1846, October 16th. He used ether, and he success. And in contrast to Mort to Wells, the audience stand up and. Clap! Wow, this is fantastic. What we, what most people don't know is that this guy uh, stayed after his success, stayed an important part of his life trying to get uh, monetary credit of it. And he soon everybody on uh, tried to patent ether. He didn't succeed, fortunately for for anesthesia at that time because. Uh, Anesthesia get a huge impulse after uh, Morton's success. But he was not a philanthropist. That's why I mean. Yeah, we, I'm going to show you the last monitors. We are, uh, three of them who are based on reflex pathways. Uh, this is a complex one. This is a suppression of the cardiovascular reflex. I will show you what, which is that. What is that? Using popillometry and the R3 reflex threshold. This is the cardian. Uh, cardiovascular death of analgesia. That stays for it. Uh, supposedly in adequate antinociception states, an increase in blood pressure generates a decrease in heart rate. This is the RR um, interval. So if it goes up, heart rates slow down. If it goes down, heart rates, because the interval is smaller. Okay? So you see how levels, uh, a little um, increase in blood pressure, and a little while, heart rates goes down. That's a principle. I'm not saying that this is truly true. That's what the manufacturer says. But during nociception or an inadequate nocicep uh, anti nociception state, the autonomic response uh, generates an increase in pressure, fully followed by a, a increase in heart rate. So heart rate goes up, and that's the principle who guides this monitor, and it also gives you an index. About 60 is bad. That's all I know. Uh, this, uh, it has few studies on it. Uh, it's an uh, inverse association between cardian and remi and remifentanil. That's not good. You're supposed to, if you have an index that's showing you how good is your analgesia, it, it at least logically to suppose that it should go uh, co-vary with remifentanil concentration. If your analgesia, your opioid concentration is higher your index should be lower, okay? Ah, but it, it does. Sorry, I missed that. Sensitivity is not as good as we want, no, nor specificity. Pupillometry is something I know a little more. We used to measure uh, pup pupil activity for uh, perceptual physiology studies, nothing to do with anesthesia. 
but it's basic to under reflex on on dilatation reflex of the pupil, which is related to subjective pain. There has been uh, studies in awake persons when when you uh, I don't know stimulate them with uh, painful stimuli and the and the pupil, pupillary reflex change. Uh, you can see here. If you produce a uh, noxious stimuli before fentanyl, the pupil size goes up. If you uh, put fentanyl and make another machine, the pupil does not move. Uh, and long after fentanyl, so the, the effect is going out, pupils start to dilate, dilate, and when fentanyl has wash out, uh, you have basically what, what was the initial state. That's how the eye moves. Uh, this correlates with uh, effect site concentration of a fentanyl. It, it, some studies have shown that it's better nociception indicator that standard variables, which are clinical variables, heart rates and, and blood pressure. It is related to pain in the post-anesthesia uh, care unit. You remember if you go under general anesthesia, you don't go to your bed afterwards, you go to a special place called uh, the post-anesthesia care unit. And there they have measured pain and the reflex and, and it has a strong correlation. One problem with this is that you have to stimuli the patient. You, you're not measured uh, surgery in, uh, uh, injury or stimuli. You're measuring a tetanus. This, you have to put, uh, give the patient a tetanus and measure the reflex. And it's an intermittent measure. It's not constant. And as you make, uh, imagine need access to the eye. Not all patients have eyes available to the anesthesiologist. Some, for example, patients that go uh, surgery in a prone position with a belly on the table. Yeah, and this is the last one. This is the uh, monitor that uses the withdrawal threshold of the R3 reflex. It's a polysynaptic uh, reflex, supposedly more suitable for measuring anesthesia effect. Uh, and the standard I, use the construction of the femoral biceps. So you have an electrode in the biceps and produce a simulation, painful simulation. Okay. It also needs some, it also measure response to another stimuli other than the surgical stimuli. So it has that problem. This is, if there's one who is still experimental, is this one. There's no monitor. We don't have an index yet of this. Uh, so, but thresholds are uh, increased and res uh, when you add uh, morphine. Uh, this, this is uh, when you have a reaction to threshold and you, when you don't have, this is when you put morphine. Uh, it has, the only advantage I see of it is, it is said that it has good predicti predictability uh, capabilities. So this is one of the few monitors that tend to predict. Most of the one I've, I've shown you only uh, detects, okay? And in those study was superior to BIS. That's not strange because BIS is not designed to do this. So that's not some, something especially good. Yeah, okay, a summary of reflex pathway. Except pupillometry, all of them have little clinical evidence. Pupillometry is of all of, of the ones I've shown you, which are very rare, still in the OR, pupillometry is the most ubiquitous. But I never seen it. Uh, uh, Cardian is invasive. You need an arterial line. That's not good because most of anesthesia don't need a, uh, an arterial line. Uh, and R3 is experimental. Pupillometry is not continued. You need to measure every time. That may be for me. It may be boring. And R3 is, is the only one to 
have shown some uh, predictability capabilities. So what is the state of the art? If, if there is one, I would say there is no one. But the most important thing is this. As anesthesiologists, we're starting to concern that it's very important to assess pain or nociception under, in the war, not only under general anesthesia, but in the war. We are, um, we were still very concerned about the patient not getting awake during surgery. That's uh, what is called awareness. It's a, it's a disaster, but it's very, very rare. If you need to uh, go to surgery, the probability that you get awareness is very little. It's more probable that you go out, take a car, and crash than awake during general session. But we, what we are starting to realize that it's not so rare is what Patrick showed you, that maybe in not so few patients we're uh, overdosing them. And as Patrick showed you, that's basically because we don't have uh, ways to assess that until now. But regarding nociception, we are still in an early uh, stage. We are taking account that is very important. We know that patients, or we know for sentence, but there are every day a more every day there's more. Uh, strong evidence that patients that you think are an, in pain or nociceptive under general anesthesia are more likely to have complications after anesthesia, mainly acute pain and chronic pain. Yeah, despite the progress, the challenge, as I told you, is still big. Uh, SPI is the most studied variable today. Does not mean it's the best. As a, as a summary, most of them do not predict, only detect. And as, as doctor and as even as a, uh, as a researcher, we know that every tool has its benefits and its limitations. So, as a, we told the student uh, yesterday, every every analysis tool you you learn uh, has limitations. Does this one have also this limitation? For example, the ones in autonomic nervous system do not work well when there's something else affecting autonomic nervous system. The ones with, based on EEG do not work well when the patient is paralyzed, okay? So this is very, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Uh, where does the uh, amnesia? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, it's not probably that but that's they they tend to associate with pain perception only in some restricted experimental conditions, not in always. We are pretty interested in gamma band. Gamma band, there's few, few studies showing that uh, it, it's a very good uh, marker of pain perception. What happens with gamma band and the general anesthesia? It's complicated. Most of the study tend to eliminate gamma band. We have to, Patrick show you uh, spectrograms for, I don't know, 40 and below, uh, 40 and up. I don't know if they filter that or I don't know what. There's nothing there, yeah. Uh, but there are some studies that have shown that uh, monkeys under propofol anesthesia and visual stimulation exhibit a gamma uh, band in visual areas. And there's an also a study in propofol in humans, uh, again with visual stimulation, that's also have shown gamma band in, uh, in, in the brain. I don't remember, probably in visual areas, I, I'm not sure. So for us, there's a hope that even with the strong influence of, of propofol and, and all the hypnotics, there's still a chance to look at gamma band in under general anesthesia. 
There's also been a lot of reports on other uh, bands, alpha bands. Uh, basically, pain tend to disrupt alpha band. There are also studies in beta band, uh, which have shown increase in beta band under pain. I would say there's not a consensus. Uh, we don't have a good marker of pain yet, even in awake patients. So, or volunteers, we need to do that first, or get a consensus at least, and then measure the effect of drugs. That way, I'm interesting, and the effects of anesthesia. Uh, Pepe, uh, uh, following the, the the strategy of hypnotics and and the EEG, uh, when when you try to to titrate analgesia. The, the best correlation probably it's it's for me at least is to know how much opioid you are giving so you can predict the patient is going to be in a good state of analgesia or not. We do that all the time with uh, remifentanil. We we know by these PK models what concentration we have uh, in the side of effect. And so we, we, we know that if we are in certain concentration and we will have that level of stimuli, well, probably the patient will not move, will not have pain, will not increase the, the, the pressure. So uh, Patrick told us that there are good fingerprints in the brain uh, with different kind of hypnotics, depending on, the, on, on, on how they act. Is there a good fingerprint in the, in the brain or... Uh, for the opioid effect that we can measure. Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, one thing, uh, you know better than I that PK, PD models are very good tools, but as a tool they have limitations. One of them is that they are basically do not take for account for individual response to drugs, as Patrick shows. We have a population prediction, not an individual prediction. And to have an individual prediction, we need to monitor or measure. Um, the opioids have, an, a, an, have an, a, a very profound effect in, on EEG signals, and the taint, basically the effect is to lower the EEG power. Uh, and uh, there are, there's a dose response of EEG s slowing and dose of, uh, of uh, opioids. That's how. You better know than better know this better than me. Then uh, that's how a Remy fentanyl Minto Schneider model was. But basically, the effect was slowing the EEG. The problem with that is that, as far as I know, there are none or few studies trying to assess how slow it, or how slow is it, or the state of slowing and the state of pain relief. How okay? I I I decrease your uh, spectral edge from I don't know 50 to say something to 20. How much pain relief is that? Is is sufficient for uh, I don't know? It's just a minor pain relief. Can you get surgery under that slowing of EEG? We're not uh, as far as I know. We don't know. Yes, the problem. Or where is discussion? Yeah. The, the the question is because well. I, regarding the, 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 the models, I, I agree with you, but it's the best we have and, and, and it works. Sure, sure. Uh, no, the, the, I like models. Uh -huh. Okay. And PKPD models. Uh. <laughs> yes, but uh, uh, the, the, the fact is, uh, with analgesia, we have these this potent drugs that are the hypnotic that, that, that uh, uh, have an, a, a deep effect in the, in the EEG activity. So the, we know the opiates. Uh, have a, a much lower effect, so there's the, the, the interaction between both. It's, it's difficult to, to 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 separate both actions in the AG, and, and that's that's the the main issue, I think. So we maybe uh, try to measure this effect in, in other kind of uh, parts uh, where the hypnotics do, do not have that that uh, confounding effect. I don't know if Patrick, with these interactions, when you're giving both drugs, is there is there something we need to go and, and, and search for? Is, is do you think this this a, a, a good part of? Uh, or what do you think is going to be the fingerprint of the of the opioid effect? Because I think that's that's the the, the key 
uh, regarding the, 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 the analgesic, uh, at least for, as a monitor for, for analgesia? Uh, Patrick can I, I would say, uh, but I will answer from my point of view, uh, I don't know if, uh, that's why I asked him if he have a, a pattern of this drug combination that is most of the time the, the real general anesthesia. But uh, um, we, I, at least I don't know if there's a fingerprint, especially in this cocktail we use. Uh, we're, we're waiting for Patrick's results, I would say. Yeah, so I guess I'd say that uh, we have limited data um, uh, and we should be you know, working on this soon where um, uh, with just the fentanyl alone, we see like uh, increasing slow oscillation power, slow delta power uh, with increasing doses of fentanyl. Um, uh, and I think what, what happens when you add uh, the other hypnotics on, on, on top of them is that, you, you're, that they're all sort of acting on this mechanism to increase, you know, slow delta oscillation. So you don't, you, you, it's very difficult to, to separate them. Uh, so in some sense, I think this strategy of essentially monitoring, you know, um, changes in autonomic response through various ways is probably, you know, the right strategy in addition to looking at, at you know, the EEG signatures. But yeah, the, 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 the opioid effect or the, the analgesic effect is masked, so, so it's, it's difficult just from the EEG alone, I'd say. And I, I would say even if you have a typical uh, opioid pattern and a hypnotic pattern, the sum or the, the, the use of the, not necessarily is linear, or m my guess is it won't be. It, and it, it will be very hard to predict from an EEG pattern. Uh, but I, I have hopes. My idea is basically to at least characterize pretty well pain EEG correlates. Once we have that, we can see what happens when you put other things on it. But we, as I told you, we, my opinion is that we don't have even get there yet. It was, uh, about, uh, apart from very rough, uh, the, uh, very rough approximation, like slowing the EEG, but that's very, very rough. It's not a pattern, I would say. Do or you it's know? a very rough pattern. But sorry, Lucia. Do you know whether people have investigated what happened with opioids in people with epilepsy? And in particular, I'm thinking, you know, we have brain surgery, right? So we have electrodes in people's brain, and the first two days they are under massive pain, and they are receiving all these drugs. So has somebody looked at those EEG that are actually are there for free? I don't know. My guess is that at least somebody has done it, but not that I don't know that I do know. Uh, opioid, if you make, uh, I don't know, Im immunohistochemistry for opioid receptor in the brain, the brain flush out. Uh, we tend to associate with them with the inhibitory descendant system, but there are opioid receptors everywhere in the brain. And how does that fact relate with epilepsy? I don't know. Uh, for the clinical and even the EEG perspective, opioids tend to be uh, depress the, uh, the brain. So my guess is it will increase uh, epileptic threshold, but that's my guess. I, ha I haven't looked at that, in, in, at least in the liter literature or something. I don't know. I don't know if it, maybe they will increase. I don't know. Really, I don't. That's a fair question, fair answer. Okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, I tried to show you very experimental uh, uh, devices, but we are now allow us per equip to show not real devices. In difference with what I showed you, these are pretty available in in the ORs. I would say not not in all ORs. They are not a standard monitoring, but they are increasingly getting into the OR because as I, as Patrick and I said. We are very now aware of the need of monitoring the brain. As Emery Brown says in one of his paper, we are probably the doctors that have more profound effects on brain dynamics, more than neurologists, even neurosurgeons, and we do not regularly monitor brain. That's 
not because we are evil people, basically we, didn't, we do not have tools yet, I would say. So Patrick and other people are working on that. And Pepe Kip, Diego, who is a bioengineer and works for Massimo, will, will show us some, some, one of these monitors, which is a Z-Line monitor, and we'll, we'll, we'll show how it works and, and what is it for. And this, the idea is to realize that, again, things you do in the lab eventually gets, in this case, in the war. So thank you.